In the last video, we introduced the alkylation of enolates as a strategy for forming new carbon-carbon bonds at the alpha carbons of aldehydes, ketones, and esters. And one thing we noted is that alkylation has some problems. For example, if we want to generate a highly substituted alkylated ketone, going through a thermodynamic enolate generally doesn't work. Acetone and methyl ketones similarly present some problems. And to illustrate this, let's think about what happens when we first treat with LDA and generate quantitatively, in other words, 100%, the enolate of acetone. And let's imagine that in the second step, we introduce some alkyl, let's say chloride, RCl. This results in the formation of an alkylated product. In other words, a product in which we've installed the R group on one of the carbons of acetone. But when the reaction is only partially over, we have that carbonyl compound in the presence of the acetone enolate, and that carbonyl compound has alpha hydrogens. In fact, that carbon, that newly created alpha carbon, if you like, that newly created secondary carbon, is more acidic in the sense that its enolate is more stable than the enolate of acetone, since now we have an additional R group connected to the double bond of the enolate. This can result in products that we don't want. For example, a second round of alkylation to form a product with two R groups linked to one of the methyl groups, or perhaps even three if this carries on and happens for a third time. It's also possible for us to alkylate at the other methyl carbon of acetone, ending up with products with two R groups on either side, or two on one side and one on the other. And ultimately, this ends up being a very messy mixture of polyalkylated products, generally not what we want. If we want to alkylate acetone only once, we have to be more deliberate in our approach. And the approach we use to get around these issues is called the acetoacetic ester synthesis. In essence, we take advantage of the fact that beta keto esters are strongly acidic at the carbon between the two carbonyl groups and the fact that we'll be dealing with an ester enolate. So there's really only one alpha carbon that can be deprotonated and we can remove the ester later. The acetoacetic ester synthesis involves three stages. In the first stage, we alkylate, and this involves the classic deprotonation of the starting carbonyl compound, followed by treatment with an alkyl halide, and as usual, the alkylation has to involve either a primary or secondary alkyl halide. The second step is basic hydrolysis, and this converts the ester group into a carboxylic acid. This step is really preparation for step three, decarboxylation or replacement of the CO2H group with a hydrogen. What the overall sequence does is it installs the electrophilic R group, the R group that came along with Rx, and it removes the ester group and replaces it with hydrogen. So one of the two hydrogens in this final product came from the decarboxylation process. And we'll see that in detail here in a little bit. The beauty of it is that we have a mono-substituted product and we've avoided all of these issues with polyalkylation that come in when we just use acetone. Notice also that we've completely avoided reactivity of the other carbon, the second methyl carbon of acetone, if you like, which was a problem that we talked about originally. This doesn't react at all because the additional ester acidifies the carbon between the two carbonyl groups. So let's dig into the acetoacetic ester synthesis in mechanistic detail. The starting material of the acetoacetic ester synthesis is an acetoacetic ester. It's a beta dicarbonyl compound with an acetyl group linked to a carbon that's linked to an ester group. So there's a carbon that generally has two hydrogens linked to it that is saturated and sitting between two carbonyl groups. Each of those carbonyl groups is electron withdrawing. Let's think about what happens when we remove H plus from this compound at the carbon between the two carbonyl groups. We end up with a heavily stabilized anion that's sitting next door to two electron withdrawing groups. So what I'm highlighting in blue, we can envision as a five atom delocalized pi system. So the negative charge is heavily delocalized in this intermediate. The beautiful thing about that is we need a relatively weak base to accomplish this. We don't need to use LDA or some kind of ridiculously strong base like sodium hydride. We can use a relatively weak alkoxide base to make this happen. And as we saw previously, when working with ester enolates, 
it's important here that the alkoxy group match the alkoxy group of the ester. So here we would want to use sodium methoxide, NaOCH3, so that this CH3 group matches the CH3 group in the starting material, just to avoid any issues with nucleophilic acyl substitution. Once we've done this, what we want to do next is install an alkyl group at this alpha carbon. This is the overarching goal of the entire acetoacetic ester synthesis, and we can accomplish it now. After treating the starting acetoacetic ester with base, we hit it with a primary or secondary alkyl halide or pseudo halide, and the process here is a simple SN2 process that occurs. This is just like the alkylation of an enolate that we saw in the previous video. This installs that alkyl group at the alpha carbon between the carbonyl groups, and in essence accomplishes our overarching goal. Where we're going from here involves removing this ester group so that the product we end up with, imagine that this ester group were replaced with H, the product we would end up with looks like something involving just a single monoalkylation of acetone. One other thing worth mentioning here is that we can repeat this process if desired. We can install a second alkyl group here. So I won't draw out the product explicitly, but we can absolutely use a second equivalent of sodium methoxide and then some different alkyl halide, let's just call it R prime X, and that will replace this hydrogen with the R prime group. Where we'd like to go from here is remove this ester group, and to do that, we need to go through a beta keto acid intermediate in which the ester group is converted to a carboxylic acid. Now we've seen how to do this. If you ignore this ketone and just focus on what's happening in the ester, ultimately what this is, is a nucleophilic acyl substitution process, right? The replacement of OCH3 by OH. We can do this using aqueous sodium hydroxide. And I won't show the mechanistic details because we've seen this reaction before. This is nucleophilic acyl substitution. The nucleophile is hydroxide and the leaving group ultimately is the methoxide group. To generate the neutral carboxylic acid, we'll use acidic workup, and so you'll sometimes see H3O plus and H2O following treatment with base, although we're going to use acid in the next step, ultimately to replace this carboxylic acid group with hydrogen. In the final stage, our goal is to convert the beta keto acid, now we've got a ketone beta to a carboxylic acid group, into a simple ketone. And what we want to do in order to do this is replace the carboxylic acid group with hydrogen. This would leave us with a product that looks like acetone alkylated once. To accomplish this, we use acid and heat. And ultimately what gets driven off is carbon dioxide. And it's worth thinking about this in a little bit of mechanistic detail. So the purpose of the acid is to do what acid does and protonate the carbonyl oxygen. What does this have to do with removing the carboxylic acid group? Well, it's a little bit tricky to see but if we think about what protonation of the carbonyl oxygen, the ketone oxygen, has done, is it set up the potential for this fragment to serve as a leaving group. Since elimination type electron flow, something like this, would generate a neutral enol. And this is essentially what happens in this process. After protonation of the ketone carbonyl oxygen, we can think about water acting as the base here. And this may occur over multiple elementary steps, but just to get the point across, I'll show all the curved arrows on one go. Water deprotonates the carboxylic acid, and there's an elimination process that takes place. And this generates CO2, which of course bubbles out of the reaction mixture. It's a gas, and the use of heat is designed to encourage the formation of CO2 by making entropy more important. And it generates the enol tautomer of the final product. And so another thing we're not seeing here that occurs is tautomerization of the enol intermediate that's generated to the final keto form. On the whole, with all the mechanistic details stripped out, all you're going to see in this third stage on, on uh, the reaction arrow is H3O+, plus, H2O, and the delta symbol to indicate heat, and the final product, and the final product will be the starting beta keto acid without the acid group, with two hydrogens linked to the alpha carbon instead of one hydrogen and a carboxylic acid group. And that's the acetoacetic ester synthesis. So on the whole, we go from a starting acetoacetic ester, that's an ester with an acetyl group linked to its alpha carbon, so that there's a carbon between two carbonyl groups, to a substituted methyl ketone through three stages, 
alkylation of an enolate, which we've seen previously, followed by basic hydrolysis to convert the ester to a carboxylic acid, and finally decarboxylation using acid and heat to replace the CO2H group with an H, generating the final substituted product.